All right. Let's see. Huh? Was it uh, Stinger G? <laughs> All right, hold on. I'm about to send the link. <laughs> Poor Alan. I'm not going to judge if he can't get to this first anymore. I'm going to put the link in the chat. Here you Alan, go. I'll let you have it. <laughs> no, don't, don't go soft on him. <laughs> no, I'm about I can't. to put some spec on my name. No, his fingers ain't handicapped right now. I'm <laughs> yeah, better put some spec on my name. <laughs> Yo, I saw the Cedric yeah. stand up. Oh, wow. oh, my God. <laughs> you tell Cedric it's your room. Tell Cedric. First of all, you got to put some respect on him. One of the original kings of comedy. All right, there you go. Link in the chat. <laughs> oh, shit. I think all of that came to the YouTube stream. Big, uh, yeah, I really like Cedric the Entertainer. He, his voice and everything makes me laugh, dude. Killer stand-up job. <clears throat> all right, here we go. Again, make sure you guys mute yourselves in the, ch in the Zoom. And all right. There we go. <laughs> Sean was playing no games. He's like, I don't care if he's got a broken foot, broken arm. I'm fucking coming to win. All right. So here we go. Ableton, Ableton, Ableton. So I want to go over some MIDI stuff first before I get into uh, the idea of effects. Um, anyway, effects racks. So First things first, if you want to load any kind of instrument onto a MIDI track, you just have to select the MIDI track, go to your sounds. Uh, in this case, I'll just go to drums. All right, and then you can either drag and drop onto the track and it'll load the instrument onto the track or you can just double click right you can just double click and it will load it onto the track that's selected right now right and it'll um, replace whatever instrument you originally had so let's go ahead and just for the sake of it i'm not going to record in um or maybe i will maybe i'll record it as clips because i don't want to record a full song or anything like that next thing you do is you want to make sure that you're receiving midi information um, into ableton so if i press my midi keyboard right now i should see this little yellow flash in the top right corner of the screen right remember that these two little squares up here tell you if midi information is coming in and or out of Ableton. The top one is MIDI information coming into Ableton. The bottom one is MIDI information going out of Ableton. <clears throat> right, so if I press these keys and I'm seeing that yellow flash, then that means MIDI information is being received into Ableton. If it's not, that's when you need to go back a step, go to live, go to your preferences, and then go to your link tempo MIDI and make sure that your device shows up here at the bottom. Mine is the impulse. So you can see that track and remote are set. So it should not only receive the, the key information, but it should also receive the knob and fader information, right? Track and remote respectively. So now we can go ahead and record enable and I should be able to hear some sound. And then let's choose a tempo just so that we can. I'm going to ch so choose something faster because we always go to 120. So let's choose something different, like 160. And then before I record anything, I want to put my metronome on, which is right up here, right? You click on the metronome to make sure that it's engaged. If you click on the down arrow right next to it, there's a little pull down menu where you can choose your count in, your sound and your division. Again, we've gone over all this before, but just reiterating some of that stuff. Right, so we've got some MIDI information right here, and it's a perfect four bar, so I don't have to worry about trimming it or doing anything like that. But what I do have to worry about is quantizing. 
So what I'll do is, in order to quantize, the notes have to be selected first. So if I just click, just click anywhere on the piano roll, if I click and drag, it selects the entire MIDI note selection. And remember, Shift Command U opens up the quantization menu. This is where you can choose to what grid you're quantizing to. So right now it says 16th notes. I believe this is 8th notes, so I'm going to change it to 8th notes. You want to be careful as to what division you're choosing because if you choose the wrong division, it could either sound really wrong or just not perfect. So make sure you know which one you're doing. And if you don't know, you could take some educated guesses, but it's really more of a music theory thing that you have to wrap your head around. So which notes do we want to, which part of the notes do we want to adjust? The start or the end? I only want to adjust the start, right? Put the start on the grid. You can do both if you want, uh, but I don't recommend it for things that are not percussive like this. It doesn't matter in a drum case too much. And then obviously the amount over here determines how much is it quantized to the grid. Is it 100% dead on the grid or is it going to be a little loose? Just hit OK, and there you go. You've got a four bar loop. But we don't have any hi-hats, so we wanna make sure we're adding some hi-hats in here. Now, I still have the track record enabled, so if I play hi-hats, right, you can still hear it, but it's not being recorded until I press the record button up here remember this little circle is the session view record button right go 16th notes right and there you go now, something to be careful of is that you see how if this is still record enabled and I go to another track and say I load in a new sound, say bass, right, I'm going to load in this bass on the new track and this might be what... Uh, I was talking about I'm not sure but now I have drums over here and I have bass over here if I want to record something new watch what happens if both of these are record enabled right one two three Oh, didn't affect it. I'm surprised. I thought it would actually record over. But if you if you do this, if you click on record over here, and both of these are record enable, it's going to overwrite it. See that? Right? So here's the here's what happened, just so that we can kind of review what happened. Gonna undo all this crap. Yeah. So what happened was, if you hit the record button over here on the clip slot, this little circle, it'll only record, it'll only record on the clip that you've selected. But if both are record enabled and you choose a different slot, but they're both record enabled, and then you hit the record button, it's going to record all the armed tracks. And so it'll overwrite whatever or rather it'll overdub whatever um, whatever you've already written. 
It's a screen recording site. A screen recording site. Oh, you're talking about OBS, maybe, Mark. I'll tell you when you come back to Zoom. Hey, Evan, we're on YouTube. Link in the chat. <clears throat> All right. So let's get some bass going. So I'm going to take this drum kit off record enable so I'm only hearing the bass. Just do something. Let's just do that. Sounds like shit, but whatever. All right. Now, here's what I'm going to do now. So, I'm going to record another MIDI... Uh, instrument, but I'm going to use something called MIDI effects to make it a little bit more interesting. Now, this is where I think it gets a little bit exciting. So, let me just mute this because I didn't like that bass line. So, if you're getting stuck as to like, oh my god, I don't know what to play, I don't know how to write stuff, I don't know anything about melodies or harmonies, something that might help you is this is this is these plugins called MIDI effects. So. Let's just load a random uh, synth on here. All right, so we have. Right, got a simple synth loaded up over here. We'll just call this synth one. Now, you can see that I can adjust a bunch of parameters over here. Right? So you can change the tone of the instrument just fine. And you guys know how to do that when you're fucking around with stuff. But in terms of playing something, you can actually do something a little bit more creative. So if you go to the left side of your browser over here, audio effects, remember, that's where you have your EQs, your compressors, and everything you already know from the Pro Tools days. But right underneath that, you have something called MIDI effects, right? And this is where it gets a little bit more interesting. So... Let's take the most popular um, example, right? The arpeggiator. So if I double click this, it's going to load an arpeggiator plugin before the actual instrument, right? This is the instrument plugin, right? Over here. And it loaded it right before the instrument plugin. And you might be wondering, well, why is that? Or you might not be wondering anything at all. So let me get rid of it and show you the difference. If I go to an audio effect, and I say EQ, right? And again, I'm on the synth. This is the instrument. If I double click the EQ, it's going to load the EQ after the instrument. Why? Because the instrument makes a sound and you want the EQ to process that sound. Right? Same thing with compressors and modulators and flangers and delays and reverbs and all that stuff, right? You want the audio to be processed and the audio only comes after the instrument, right? Remember the signal flow here is the keyboard is a MIDI keyboard. It's sending MIDI data into Ableton. The MIDI data is triggering this sound library to create a sound, this sound in particular, and then that sound will then be processed by what's called audio effects. So that's the signal flow. MIDI keyboard sends MIDI data to your instrument the instrument produces sound the sound gets processed by your audio effects but what i'm doing when i add a midi effect like an arpeggiator is that the midi keyboard is sending midi data but before it touches the instrument it's going to get manipulated by the arpeggiator and that manipulated midi signal is then going to feed the instrument and that's going to produce the sound afterwards so what do I mean by that? An arpeggiator is basically a plugin where you can press down multiple keys at a time and the plugin will have the MIDI notes arpeggiate between them or uh, alternate between all the notes depending on your settings. 
So this is something I'm sure you've heard before. Once I play it, you'll definitely hear it. So look, if I don't have an arpeggiator and I want it to play something really interesting, I might have to play it manually, right? Right? Right, I'm not very good at playing on the keyboard. But you get the idea, you'd have to play it manually. But not with an arpeggiator. With an arpeggiator, you can actually have the plugin do all the movement and processing of it. What's up, Glenn? We are on YouTube. Link is in the chat. So check this out. Load up, load up the arpeggiator, and you can see that the style is set to up, which means that if you hold three notes down, it'll go from first note to second note to third note. First note, second note, third note. First note note second note third note one two three one two three one that's the up style right now there's a lot of the little buttons that you could actually get into like you can transpose and you can change the steps and the beat and everything but i want to keep it very very simple so if i hold three notes down right now one two three one two three one two three one two three one right so what i'm doing is i'm just holding these notes down One more time. If I just hold one note, it just plays that one note. If I hold two notes down. And then three notes. Right? So I only have to hold it down and the arpeggiator does all the actual movement for me, right? Now, one thing is that it's going up. So whatever notes I hold, it starts from the first note and goes incrementally upwards. The next thing is that it's going at a specific rate. And what rate is that? It's exactly the rate of the project tempo and it's going at eighth notes in this particular case. You can see right here that it's set to eighth notes, right? So if I hit play and I hold those notes down, right? And I'm just holding these notes down. I'm not playing this. And then you can change the rate. Right? Really cool what you can do with this stuff. You can also set a little gate to control the length of the notes in the pattern. Uh, you can, uh, well, this is more for if you do the re-trigger thing. I don't want to get into that. But you get the idea is that you can set up a style, you can set the rate, and you can set a gate. Now, if you wanted to, you can actually uh, pitch shift it if you wanted to. Right? So you don't actually have to know how to play a lot of these things. Right? So what this is basically doing is that it's transposing whatever note you're playing into the key of whatever you set. So it's pretty interesting. You don't even have to know that for sure. Um, but let's get into the different styles because I kind of like that. Right, the up one is the most standard one. Right, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. There's a down one as well. Three, two, one, three, two, one, three, two. So it's taking the notes in ascending order, in the order, and ascending order, and playing them backwards. So start with the third note, then the second note, then the first note. Right? Then you have up and up, down. Right, that's one, two, three, one, one, two, three, two, one, two, three, two, one, two, three, two, one, two, three, two, and then you have down, up, down, three, down, three, two. Shit, what is it? 
three two one two 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 three right and then you have up and down which is one two three three two one right so up down is one two three two one two three two one two three two one two three everybody says stranger things and i can't remember the notes i think it's like I can't remember what uh, Stranger Things was. I can't remember the notes, but yeah, you can do the whole Stranger Things with that as well. If somebody, if somebody can write the notes, then I will play it, but I don't actually remember. But anyway, you have a bunch of these different options for arpeggiators, right? It kind of makes it a little bit more interesting uh, in terms of, you know, if you can't play something fast, then you just hold the notes down and then switch up the rate. Makes sense. So there you go. You have something called the arpeggiator. Now you also have this little thing called uh, retrigger. I don't want to get too much into that, but basically, when you start to play more notes, right? You start off with three notes. This determines does the loop start over from the beginning? Does it continue? Right? Because when you re enter a note does it re-trigger the entire arpeggiator back from the beginning or does it continue or does it re-trigger based on the actual beat right uh, it's a little bit something more that you have to play with rather than me explaining it but hopefully you get the idea of an arpeggiator right and you have really cool things you can have a random one too so if if anything if you don't know how to do um basically any kind of playing you can go into your midi piano roll and just draw this stuff right so if you just did c d sharp and g and then you just set that to your oop, you just set that to your loop that's all you'd have to do Right? You don't even have to play you don't even have to play the notes if you don't know them, right? So that's kind of the beauty of doing things like anything MIDI effect, what's happening is that it's taking the MIDI data that you're playing, manipulating the MIDI data, not the sound, the MIDI data, that's being fed into your sound library. That's triggering a sound, and then you manipulate it with EQs and compressors and stuff. So hopefully that makes sense in terms of how you can get a little bit more interesting sound. Now, what I maybe should have started with is if you don't even know how to play chords like that, you can go to your chord setup. Now, this is a really cool thing. If I press one note, right, I can have the chord plugin create chords without me having to play the actual chords. So what do I mean by that? So if I play one note and then I shift it up by maybe... Uh, three semitones now when I play the note it's gonna play the original note and the minor third some dark shit right I'm only pressing one note and if you don't believe me then well 
Fine, I'll just add two more. So then... Right? There's no way I can play six notes because I only have five fingers. So there you go. So the chord plugin allows you to create chords of your own without knowing exactly how to play them manually. This is really good if you, again, don't know how to play a keyboard, but you can get really interesting sounds just by using your ears. If you can find two notes that mesh well together, that essentially is a dyad. And then if you add more on top of that, I guess it becomes a chord. I don't know if two notes actually can, two notes when played together, I don't think technically make up what's called a chord. A chord has to be three notes minimum, right? So if you have, say, your C note, actually, let's just go ahead and record C. So that's your note. So if I add a note, right? It's just one note. And then if you're clever, you can add an arpeggiator. get the idea right you can have a lot of fun with that stuff anyway there's a bunch of different midi um effects that you can start to play with some of them are a little bit more intuitive than others right actually a lot of them are very intuitive but the ones that you're primarily going to be using are the arpeggiator the chord sounds like michael jackson those progressions you were playing yeah fucking thriller or something <laughs> uh yeah if i take off the arpeggiator that nightmare thriller vibe. I don't actually know what chord that is. Does anybody know what the chord is? It's a minor third and a. Well, I don't know. I don't want to try that shit. Let's try a different. Uh, uh, let's see. So scale. Scale is another good one, where you can. Right. Right. You've got your. You've got your notes that you have selected here. Now, check this out. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So you see that this is a twelve by twelve matrix, right? So each square represents the note that you're playing, as well as the note that is heard back. I know that's really confusing, especially to people who already know music. This is a little bit confusing but just hang tight, right? So check this out. If I wanted to make sure that every single note that I played was in the scale of C major, if you don't know what C major is, it's this. But if I'm just hitting random keys, right? Right, sometimes I'll hit those black notes which are out of the scale. So what I could do is I could click on all the all the all the black notes which are the second semitone, fourth semitone. So now what I did was I blacked out all the keys that are not in the scale of C major. So check this out. No matter what I do, they're muted. Right? So this way I can't actually miss. Now another thing that I can do is I can transpose it so that it transposes the entire scale. Oh, wait, so it changed over there, but you get the idea. 
Another cool thing that I can do is instead of keeping these as silent, the black keys as silent, I can say, hey, I want you to play whatever the note before it was. So watch this. C. I'm playing C sharp on the keyboard, but it's still playing middle C. Pretty cool, right? Now, this kind of becomes interesting because if you don't know your scales, then you can kind of just cheat the system in a way because then you can just do... Right? No matter what you play, it will always be in scale. Right? So if you can't tell, this is all C major. Right? No matter what I play, I'll be in scale. So this is really good if either you don't know your scales or you're really bad at scales, right? I'm not even looking. Everything was technically in scale. So that's kind of a fun little trick that you can use. I think it's pretty cool. Ah, oh, that's what I wanted. So now if you want to transpose to D major and you don't know how to play D major, you can just take it up two semitones right here. Boom. Again. And uh, just so that you believe me, I'm not actually changing uh, anything. I'm still playing C major, which is this. Right? And if I up the transpose to six semitones, it'll be a new scale. I'll do it one more time. Transpose up to nine semitones. So again, oh, I don't know if you saw that. Right? So you don't actually have to know how to play any other scale if you just use the scale plugin. You could literally choose, if you know C major, you can play every single other scale. Just map the keys correctly and transpose down. And that goes for chords and everything too, right? Pretty dope. So there you go now by default uh the bass is set to or the 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 key that you're looking at right here this is c to uh b right c to the octave b or to the same scale octave same octave scale b c to this b now you can change the bass whichever com whichever key you're comfortable in right so if you're if you're super comfortable in d major You can make sure that any note you play will stay in the key of D major. So it's really for that if you have a scale that you're comfortable with, and usually C major is the one everybody's comfortable with, you can actually play every single other scale, and you can either map out the black keys to be muted or map out the black keys to be in the scale of C major so that you don't have to worry whatever note you hit, you will actually hit something that's in scale. It's pretty wild, if you ask me. You have a very basic pitch MIDI uh, plugin. So if I play C and I transpose down, I'm playing C, I'm not playing anything else. Right? So that just does some basic pitching. Um, and then there's one called velocity in which you can actually alter the velocity. I don't think this is a good example of the note. This is a good, not a good example for this um, instrument. But where that velocity thing could come into play is if you do, in, if you get into automation, you can actually can automate the way the velocity reacts across the song, which is pretty cool. But yeah, there you go. MIDI, um, 
MIDI effects are effects that process the MIDI data before it even touches the sound library. And it's really cool if you don't really know either how to play or if you want to start getting a little bit more creative with how you approach songs. If you are tired of using the same old techniques, challenge yourself by putting in an arpeggiator or choosing a different scale or something, right? It's a really cool way that you can get creative. But what I want to get into now is some rack effects. So let's see what this is, this warping thing. Uh, don't save, I didn't really do anything. What is this? All right. All right, so we've got, what, audio, some MIDI, and some sounds. Okay, so we have some drums over here. You already know how to add plugins, right? All you need to do is select the track, go to audio effects, pull up whichever effect you want, like say EQ, choose your effect type, double click, and there it is. Right? Let's choose something a little bit more interesting. It's kind of boring. Right, so we got our drums. Let's go to audio effects, add EQ. Maybe you want to add a compressor right afterwards. So you go to dynamics, compressor, set your threshold. Want drums to punch so we get like a slightly slower attack. And then maybe we'll add hmm. No, maybe we'll just add an EQ and a compressor, right? Now, suppose like these are settings that you're like, you know what? This works really well for drum kits in general. This is a good starting place for drum drums in general. EQ and a compressor, right? Now, individually with each plugin, you can save a preset so if you go to the actual plugin, remember this yellow button is the bypass, but all the way on the other end, there's a little icon for save. So if you click on that save, it allows you to save a preset of the plugin, right? So in this case, this is like G drums. So now if for some reason I delete that EQ and I'm like, oh, okay, I can't remember what is the setting that I usually go with for drums. It's an EQ, but I can't remember the preset. I can go to my user library, go to my presets, audio effects, EQ, and then just double click on G drums. And there it is, the exact same setting that I had. Same thing for the compressor, right? You can go ahead and hit save. And remember, all these will be saved in the user library, not in the audio effects. Now, I think when you go to SAE, they don't allow you to... Um, save presets onto the computer because then everybody would be saving presets and we'd run out of space really fast. But know that this is a really cool way that you can save your presets. You can do that in Pro Tools too, but here's another cool thing that you can do. Suppose you're like, okay, I love my vocals, right? Let's say, let's listen to these vocals. So suppose you're like, I like these vocals with this EQ, but it definitely needs some compression. So you're like, I'm going to go ahead and add my compressor over here. Whoa. Oh, maybe 
it doesn't need compression. All right, so that's your compressor. And you're like, you know what? This is going to be the sound of my uh, telephone vocals. EQ plus a compressor. That's my telephone sound. I don't need just the EQ. I want this compressor sound as well. Or you want to create your own whole new sound, right? You're like, I want my telephone effects to always have like a flanger effect on them. So you go ahead and add a flanger. So you're like, this is my new vocal sound, whatever it will be, right? So you have a definite chain of plugins that you want to put your vocals through. EQ with this telephone effect, compressor, and then a flanger, right? These three together create your vocal chain. And you're like, you know what? I want to make sure I save this for future projects because this is my sound. This is what people are going to pay me for in a matter of speaking, right? So what you can do is you can select the first plugin and then you can hold shift to select all three plugins. Remember, this is the same as Pro Tools. Remember, click, hold shift, and then select on the last plugin, and that'll select all plugins, right, in between the two. So now you have all three plugins selected. What you can do is you can group all these three plugins into what's called a rack, all right? An effects rack is one of Ableton's highlights. So watch what happens. I have them all selected. If I press Command G, watch the two sides over here and over here. You'll see an additional bar gets created. One, two, three, right? You saw that? This little bar, this extra bar over here got created. All three effects are now, if I select them, Command G, all three effects are now in what's called an effects rack. You guys already know what a rack is, right? You've already seen my rack setup over here, right? And usually this is where you can put different effects. Like you can have a preamp here, interface, compressor, power conditioner, whatever, right? A rack is basically a device or rather it's a tool where you can mount multiple effects. So here you've got three plugins, all part of what's called an effects rack, right? Now, if you want to see more details, come over to the left side where it says audio effect. If you just tilt your head, you can see that it says audio effect. But if you want to see it more clearly, you can click on this little button over here, which is basically showing you what's con what's what the rack is made up of. So it's made up of a chain, a serial chain. What does serial mean? It just means one after the other after the other, right? So it's a chain of EQ to compressor to flanger. That's the chain that we talked about, right? And we'll call this one tele teleflange, right? That's my teleflange effect. So all three plugins are now grouped into an effects rack. And the cool thing is you can actually save this as a preset on your computer. So if you click the little save button on the effects rack, you can call this G Vox or G Teleflange, right? Or G Special Vox. Let's call it Special Vox. So what does that mean? That means if I go ahead and open another session, like say, I can't remember, Bad Day? What the fuck is that? Anybody remember what that is? No, I don't want to risk it. So if I open my intro view session, uh, I didn't save and change anything, so, right? Oh, this is the same shit. Yeah, it's the same shit. If I go to sampling. The parameter. Okay. What? Purpose, 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 purpose. So suppose I wanted to put my special Vox effects on this sample. I can go to my user library, go under presets, go under audio effects, but then I'm going to go under this thing called audio effect rack. All right. Then you can see that my special Vox is right here. So when I double click this, it's going to load the exact chain 
that I was using before. Right? So it's cool because now you have your vocal chain for whatever project that you do. Now you can apply this for all the vocals that you do. You can throw it on your friends. You can throw it on people you're producing. And you can be like, this is your vocal sound, right? Now, look. What's going to happen is if you start recording other tracks and other people and even different songs, you're going to have to adjust the settings of the compressor and the flanger and everything like that. But the general vibe of the vocal chain is retained, which is the coolest thing. Well, I think it's cool. Now, you can do this in Pro Tools too, and pretty sure I showed you. But if I haven't, uh, I will. Sh and you're curious, I will show you how to do that. But there you go. You have a whole vocal chain that you can sum up or bring up anytime you want to, right? So another cool thing about this whole effects chain is that right now you can see this little um, bar indicates that these three plugins are happening in series, which means it goes the vocals go to the EQ, then it goes to the compressor, then it goes to the flanger. But what you can do in the rack which is really, really cool, is that you can create a new chain and have that chain operate in parallel or at the same time as the initial chain, right? So check this out. I'm going to make a new chain and I'm going to call it Disti, Distvox, right? So you can see that when I select the new chain, it says drop audio effect here. Remember, this bar indicates the end of the rack. If I drop a plug in here, it's going to go outside of the rack. This is inside the rack. So let's go to, say, drive and color. Let's load up a overdrive, right? Let's load up a uh, saturator. Let's just, like, you know, really load this baby up, right? Now, you have two chains going in parallel. Right, you have the first chain with the EQ, compression, flanger, and then you have another chain underneath it that's going at the exact same time. And you can see that both chains have a level, have a pan, right? This is the level, up and down. This is the pan, left and right. This is the mute and the solo button, right? So there you go. You have two chains in parallel. So, for example, if I just solo the second chain, all you should hear is distorted vocals. This is a fight. This is a weird ass. This is a weird ass deed. <laughs> right? Uh, how do I turn this down? I'm going to use like some sort of attenuator. Uh, if there is an attenuator over here. Tuner. Nope. 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 I want something to put the vocals down. So maybe I'll just use, does this limiter come with a negative gain? Let's find out. Yes. Okay. This is a fight. This is a weird ass. This is a weird ass. Feed, 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 feed. The parameter. Right. The parameter. What? Purpose, purpose. Right. So all we're hearing is the distorted vocals because I've muted the top chain. I'm only hearing the second chain. If I solo the first one, we're hearing the original teleflange effect. And then if I make sure they're both active or unsolo both of them, you'll hear both at the same time. And you can balance the level between the two chains individually. So you can say, you know, the t distortion needs to come down a little bit over here. So this is really cool if you want to create your own kind of sounds, not just for vocals, but for any instrument that you can think of, right? Or you can pan them left and right. I don't know if you can tell. It's hard to tell with this panning. I don't really like the panning for vocals, but when you have them centered, you can dial them in so where you have the telephone effect, the flanger effect, and then you can sorry, and then you can dial in just a little bit of distortion to make it sound a little bit more gritty, right? So if I turn the second chain all the way down, 
We're just hearing the telephone and the flanger effect. But if we turn up the second chain, the permit. What purpose? 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 Is what? 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 The fight. Right? You get the idea. So I think that's a really killer way to start creating your own sounds just for your producer sounds or like who you are as a mix engineer. You can start defining your sounds just through using these things called uh, effects racks, right? And you can have multiple chains if you want to. I can't remember the limit of it, but you can go pretty hard. So that's a really, really powerful tool that you can use, right? Now, the cool thing about these effects racks is that they're not exclusive to or sorry, the cool thing about racks is that they're not exclusive to just audio effects. And this is one of the coolest things about Ableton that I love, right? The whole idea of parallel chains is huge. So what you can do is, if you have a MIDI track and you say, load up a sound, say, uh, let's just go with basic grand piano, right? Right? You've got a grand piano sound over here. And suppose you're like, ah, I want my piano to be a little bit, have a little bit more character to it. So you're like, I'm going to add a, uh, actually, I do like to have like a little phaser on it just to make it a little bit more interesting, right? But dial back. Maybe put a compressor on there. Maybe put a limiter just to turn it up. Right? So we've got kind of an interesting piano sound. It's got a little bit of phaser buried and buried beneath it, right? It's very subtle. It's subtle, right? But then what you can do is if you group your grand piano with your audio effects, and then press command G, you've essentially what created what's called an instrument rack. So an instrument rack, just like an audio rack, allows you to combine multiple effects together with your instrument. So you have a grand piano going into a flanger, compressor, and limiter, and that is your first chain for the instrument rack. But then what's cool about this is that now you can go into your sounds and layer your grand piano with other sounds. So look, we have another instrument. If I drag this down over here, it creates a new chain in parallel with the grand piano. So now we got something a little bit more interesting, right? Maybe we'll have voices. These voices are terrible. Get rid of this one. Right? So what I've essentially done is I've combined my grand piano with two other instruments and created a whole new instrument of my own. And if you go ahead and start manipulating the individual instruments more and more and more, you get more and more unique sounds. So what you're essentially doing is you're using the instruments that you have as the building blocks to combine multiple instruments and then create your own fucking instrument. It's really fucking cool, right? Combine that with the arpeggiator stuff that we already learned about. If you add an arpeggiator in front...
right? You can get really, really creative in like what you can actually do. So the rack idea is really, really powerful in Ableton. It allows you to combine multiple effects racks, uh, sorry, multiple effects into one rack, or you can combine multiple instruments into a rack and all the different chains can be processed in parallel at the same time. It's very, very powerful to create your own unique sound. This is something that Pro Tools cannot do, which I love Ableton for. The idea of having parallel sounds is really, really insane. Now look, you can use this as a much simpler way, in a much simpler way, right? So for example, if we have, what's, let's just like, uh, Let's just go ahead and start with these vocals again, right? The, song, the fight. That's some weird ass. Right. So let's start with some basic processing. Suppose, suppose you have, you know, EQ. The, song, the fight. That's some weird ass. Right. You just use something like that. Uh, maybe we'll do this. Dynamics. The, song, the fight. That's some weird ass. Right. You got your compressor. That kind of combines into a rack of its own. Now, what I've always taught you is that if you wanted to add reverb or delay, you use the sends over here, right? The, song, the fight. The some weird ass. But remember how, like, I used to say uh, sometimes for certain projects or a lot of projects that I like to use, I like the vocals to have their own reverb, the drums to have their own reverb, the uh, guitars to have their own reverb, and not to have them all exactly the same. Because in this case, you see how A and B are all going to the same reverb and delay, which is fine, which is actually the traditional console way of doing things, and a lot of people do it this way. But if you use the idea of effects racks, you can actually use it in a more creative way, like using the other chains to do reverb and delay processing. So if I create a new chain and just add a reverb to it, I'm going to add this in here. Then, the, song, the fight. The some weird ass. I can use this little knob over here to blend in the reverberated version of the actual reverb, right? So check it out. As I turn this up, you'll hear more reverb. The, song, the fight. The some weird ass. The some, the some weird ass. Feed, 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 feed. The, para the parameter. What? Purpose, 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 purpose. Right? Same thing with delay. You can actually add a delay as a new chain. Reverb, vox, delay. I'm going to call this vox verb. Right? So now you have your reverb and your vocal reverb and your vocal delay within your instrument. I'm sorry, within your effect rack. And you can dial them in just like you would when you do sends the, song, the fight the some weird ass the some, the some weird ass feed 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 feed, 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 feed. The, song, the fight the some weird ass the some, the some weird ass feed 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 feed, feed, feed. the para the parameter what purpose 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 is what 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 the, the fight right so again, you can get very, very creative with this. And you can say, this is my general vocal chain. So you don't even have to set up all these reverb sends and delays or everything if you don't want to. You can call this audio effect rack your basic vox chain. So then, whenever you create a new session, right? Uh, don't save. And you're about to start recording some vocals, right? You just... Test, test, test. Hello. And you don't want to hear me twice, so I'm just going to mute myself over here. There you go. So now I got my vocals coming in. If I load up my preset, hello. 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 This is my default chain. And if I want more reverb, I just turn it up. And if I don't want less reverb, then I just turn this down over here. Right? Test, test, test. And if I want some delay, I can add it up. I can add it up. I can add it up. I can turn it down. <laughs> you get the idea, right? You can start getting really cool with a click of a button, two clicks of a button. You can open up your entire vocal chain. It's really, really wild. You don't have to save any kind of settings for your sends, or you don't have to set up new reverb and delay sends. That's the cool thing about Ableton is that it gives you that option to actually set up things the way you want to.
so yeah i think that's really cool i think that's a game changer the idea of effects racks and instrument racks that is like a game changing um a, a game changing implementation of audio that no other at least i don't know any other daw that does it maybe logic does it maybe fruity loops does it but this shit is the coolest thing in the world the idea of chaining multiple effects into a rack and then having another set of multiple effects going in parallel i think it's amazing and you can do that with instruments too which is mind-blowing so yeah hopefully that was informative um let's take it back to zoom then hopefully you guys got all that